good afternoon everyone i take india welcomes all the participants for today's regional distance learning seminar series session today's topic is hiv and oi gastrointestinal system and the speaker is dr rajiv ade uh, dr rajiv ade is a technical specialist public health with i tech india we welcome you sir for today's session and request you to start the session thank you swetha ji everybody so we had a lot of technical issues today and the topic is also quite long lengthy so let me go straight away into the uh, subject matter it was uh, earlier taken by dr guho as uh, as a part of dissemination of national art guideline as a ndls a long back so today's discussion would be basically a recapitulation of what we have learned from but today's session content next slide please next slide please oh, okay so today we'll be discussing the uh, oral pathology and then diarrhea and other intestinal and uh, bacterial enteric infections management of diarrhea and cystoidosis cystoisosporiasis and other causes of diarrhea and pl hiv and annulations so coming next to next slide please so the background background uh this uh, diarrheal disorders anybody who is working in the art center they know it very well that most of the time many of the our plh be present with diarrheal uh, uh, complaint i mean uh, complaint of the gastrointestinal tract and the evaluation is also important because there is no specific signs and symptoms of a particular uh, uh, gi patho uh, disease and there are multiple gi infections can be uh, Uh, we can find multiple gi uh, disorders at the same time in the same individual particularly when it is a plhiv so it is very important for us it is it is very common to find and also it is at times difficult to differentiate different gi infections and diseases from one another so we need to uh, learn more about uh, this uh, gi uh, pathologies in plhiv next slide please so the common gi manifestations that a patient nausea vomiting weight loss abdominal pain anorectal diseases jaundice hepatomegaly gi bleeding diarrhea dysphagia odynophagia etc so this uh, combination of these signs and symptoms and the signs based on all these thing and depending on little bit of investigation we can class also treat them so next slide please <sighs> so in the oral pathology you will find candidiasis either in the form of oral candidiasis or esophageal candidiasis angular stomatitis or angular chylitis then oral ulcers this can be different types of ulcer like uh, uh, candidal ulcers it can be cytomegalovirus or it can be or, uh, or even uh, kaposi's sarcoma then necrotizing gingivitis and we'll in individually we'll examine each of the diseases uh, in the subsequent slide next slide please next slide please so oral candidiasis as you know it is otherwise known as oral thrush and it is caused by an yeast called candida albicans and in hiv negative uh, in hiv negative it occurs usually in infant and elderly uncontrolled diabetes and prolonged antibiotic use high dose systemic steroid immunosuppressant cytotoxic drug etc otherwise these are not common in hiv negative individual but in pl hiv it is quite uh, common to find this kind of uh, oral uh, candidiasis or esophageal candidiasis particularly when the disease is a advanced disease one and is a pointer towards a stage 3 disease in case of uh, pl hiv that means an advanced disease next slide please so the presentation as we all know that it is a white uh, patches surrounded by red borders and mostly affecting the uh, tongue inside of the mouth and uh, in the mucosa of the lips there are four types of candidiasis these are pseudomembranous or oral thrush erythematous angular chylitis and hyperplastic now plhiv often complain of having no taste swelling is usually frequently painful but just below the back of the throat and not lower down the sternum because if it is lower than the sternum we call it odynophagia which is a sign of uh, esophageal candidiasis but in case of uh, oral candidiasis it is just below uh, behind the throat back of the throat next slide and diagnosis 
is basically it is clinical and in contrast to oral hair leukoplakia, the differentiation is that in case of candidiasis, we can easily strip off the membrane, but in case of uh, uh, oral hair leukoplakia, it is difficult. And lab confirmation, we can do it by scrapping and of the uh, characteristic yeast cells or the hyphal form of the candida is found in uh, potassium hydroxide preparation. And cultures of clinical exudative material also yield the species of candida, but these are hardly necessary. In most of the cases, it is a clinical diagnosis and we can successfully diagnose and treat them based on uh, uh, our uh, of the, uh, uh, sign and symptoms and proper evaluation. Now, treatment is usually nystatin or suspension 1 ml swast around the mouth for a few minutes and then swallowed four times a day for five days. Alternatively, we can apply local cotrimazole. It is not cotrimoxazole. It is cotrimazole, mouth paint. And uh, in... Uh, or alternatively, we can also use fluconazole, 100 to 150 milligram once a day for one week. And in case of children, it is six milligram per kg per day. Next slide, please. In oral candidiasis, it is a WHO stage four condition, usually diagnosed clinically based on the presence of oral candidiasis along with this uh, uh, dysphagia or, or dinophagia. Now, dysphagia means uh, difficulty in swallowing, while odinophagia means in full deglutition, and the pain is felt uh, along the skinny PLHIV with the sign and symptoms of dysphagia or odinophagia, and having an evidence of oral candidiasis should be presumptively treated for However, we can also prove it uh, by doing an endoscopy. The appearance of the esophageal candidiasis uh, looks like the picture on the right hand side. Uh, often associated with not eating and consequent weight loss is also there, but uh, more commonly associated with lower CD4 count, especially for oral thrush. And esophageal thrush qualifies the patient to be in uh, WHO stage four. And symptoms like weight loss, lethargy, or any then should not be attributed to esophageal candidiasis alone, particularly in the adult. But in the children, it can give rise to weight loss also. We'll see later. Now, uh, children, unlike adults, often experience nausea and vomiting. Children with esophageal candidiasis may present with dehydration and weight loss. Classic symptoms and signs of esophageal candidiasis may be absent in children. That is, odinophagia and all this may not be found in a children. And especially those children who are on ART, because this uh, esophageal candidiasis and oral candidiasis mostly happen when the CD4 uh, count goes down uh, uh, significantly. That is, advanced immunosuppression only gives rise to uh, this uh, oral and esophageal candidiasis in PLHIV. And diagnosis is, um, is basically clinical. And uh, and uh, we empirically start uh, antifungal. And we also look for the response to therapy, because here, response to therapy also points to the fact that whether our diagnosis is correct or not. So we'll see later on that uh, after seven days of initiation of a, uh, antifungal, we usually review the case to see the response. If the response is adequate, then we continue. That means our diagnosis is was correct. Retrospectively, we can say so. The definitive diagnosis, however, requires endoscopic visualization of the lesion and with histopathological demonstration of characteristic candida yeast forms in tissues. But these are hardly required in, uh, uh, in most of the cases. These are not required. Confirmation is done by fungal culture and the speciation, that is the species of the uh, fung fungus can also be determined by doing uh, culture and sensitivity, but uh, these are not routinely required. Now, uh, the other causes that may mimic esophageal candidiasis are uh, the reflux esophagitis, the pain of re reflux esophagitis, and esophageal ulcer, say aphthous ulcer, or herpes simplex virus ulcer, CMB virus, Kaposi's sarcoma, or tubercular ulcer. All these ten can mimic uh, esophageal candidiasis in the form of uh, uh, dysphagia or odinophagia. So we need to keep this in mind. If the, our treatment with antifungal fails to elicit response within seven days, then we need to think either uh, it is a resistance to antifungal, resistance strain, or it may be a other diagnosis out of those which are listed on the right-hand side. Now, treatment is fluconazole, 200 milligram orally. 12 to uh, 14 to 21 days and check the response to treatment after seven days. If there is good response, continue with fluconazole for 10 days or two weeks. 
So here the difference is in oral candidiasis, we are treating for one week. And in case of esophageal candidiasis, we are treating it two to three weeks. Now, if fluconazone is not effective after one week, consider the following. If not responding to fluconazole, treat for herpes simplex virus with a cyclovir 400 milligram three times a day. So it is a syndromical approach. Even without confirming or going for any lab test, we can go for uh, uh, treatment with acyclovir if the patient fails to respond to fluconazole. And if we can exclude that the, uh, 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 the organism is not resistant to fluconazole, then we can easily go for uh, treating it with uh, acyclovir, considering it to be HSV. Now, majority of those with the cytomegalovirus virus infection will definitely come with a CD4 count very low, either it is less than 100 or even less than 50. So in combination of those clinical sign and symptoms on the CD4 uh, level, we can uh, treat it with the valgancyclovir oral or gancyclovir injectable. In either of the case, we need to ensure that the ART is effective. If the patient is not on ART, we should put him on ART after control of the uh, uh, OI and after excluding TB. And if the patient is on uh, ART, then we need to go for a viral load test, whether the patient is uh, failing on the ART or not. Now, the fluconazole dose in case of children is 6 mg per kg per dose, and uh, maintenance is 3 to 6 mg per kg for, again, 21 days, 4 to 21 days. Maximum is 400 mg per day. Now, angular stomatitis presents as inflamed, painful cracks at the corners of the mouth, which is also known as uh, angular chylitis, and it is usually caused by candida. However, uh, bacteria can also cause it, like staphylococcus, and usually it responds well to antifungal creams such as uh, clotrimazole or even nystatin drops rubbed into the cracks. Now, oral ulcer, as you can see on the left-hand side, this is a classical aphthous ulcer, oval, and uh, the cause is not known. usually found in the peer count. However, CD4 count is not a, 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 a higher CD4 count also can have uh, this kind of ulcers and treatment is effective with ART. If already on ART, ensure that the patient is virally suppressed. That I was telling that uh, if the patient develop all this condition, then we, do, we need to reassure that. Uh, hello. Uh, sir, some problem with the slides. Can you please tell me the slide? This slide is the slide. Is Slide is uh, your, uh, your by habit. I have been pressing in my laptop. That's why it uh -huh, uh -huh. That, that's the reason because I wasn't moving slides. 19. Yeah, please check, sir. Is this the slide? Yeah, yeah. Right. No, just the previous one. The photo one, previous one. Uh, is this yes. correct? No, no. You go to slide number 19. Okay. 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 Is this correct, sir? Yeah. No, no. 19. Go to 19. No. 19 number slide. The thing is, I have deleted the pre-test, post-test, sir. So, my slides and your slides are not matching. You go below more. Further. You go further. Further. Next slide, next slide, next, 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 bus. Here, here, you stop here. Okay, okay, sir. Previous, previous. Okay, sir. No, no, you go back, previous. That lady, you know, two lady, two tongue ulcers were there. Ah, One yeah. is a ulcer. No, no, previous. Ah, this one, this, keep that one, no, that lady, two ladies are there, no? Previous, this one, this one, keep here. Right, keep here. right, sir, right, sir. Okay. So, we are discussing about uh, that uh, uh, aphthous ulcer and herpes simplex virus. So, the difference is that in herpes simplex, you, you will find the blisters like ulcers. And uh, this, are, this usually involves the uh, lips also. 
but in case of aphthosis, they usually within the mucosa inside the mouth, and these are oval characteristics which which we know. And the causative agent, uh, the cause is basically not known for aphthous ulcer. However, it is presumed to be uh, due to viral, and usually low CD4 count is associated with it. However, high CD4 count, PLHIV with high CD4 count can also have this kind of aphthous ulcer. And the treatment is effective with ART. So if we put the patient on ART of all the uh, contraindications, then with the uh, restoration of CD4 count, uh, this will go off. Now, in herpes simplex, the treatment is with acyclovir, 400 milligram three times a day for 10 to 10, uh, 5 to 10 days. And for children, it is 15 milligram per kg per dose orally, five times a day for 7 to 10 days. So the difference is in adult, it is three times a day, but for children, it is five times a day. And we should uh, remember that in uh, this uh, uh, herpes, uh, oral, uh, then uh, uh, this uh, topical uh, acyclovir is not effective. Now, the other ulcer that are possible is the syphilitic ulcer. Now, this syphilitic ulcer looks like sh uh, shank, shank pride, but then the difference is it is painless, almost always painless. And we can confirm it by doing a VDRL where the titer will be very high. And if it is found to be uh, syphilitic, then we should treat it with the penicillin 2.4 million unit intramuscularly for three weeks. Once a week for three weeks. Now coming to Kaposi's sarcoma, the clinical presentation is usually purply fleshy swelling on the roof of the mouth or gum. Next slide, next slide. Next slide, please. Yeah. So Kaposi's sarcoma usually presents with purplish fleshy swelling on the roof of the mouth or gum, which may often bleed. And because it has a tendency to bleed, so there are occult uh, uh, GI bleeding, which can give rise to anemia. So we, can, we should also evaluate for hemoglobin. And if there are any uh, chest symptoms in the form of a cough or respiratory distress, we also need to uh, do a chest X-ray. Now, diagnosis is usually made on history and typical characteristic of the lesions and the distribution. Now, treatment is, uh, since it is a WHO stage four clinical condition, so we need to put the patient on uh, portrimoxazole prophylaxis CPT, and we should just start ART if the patient is is ART need, we should start ART as early as possible. And if the patient is already on ART for more than six months, then we should uh, in, uh, go for a viral load estimation just to exclude that the patient is uh, whether failing on the ART. If so, then we need to switch the patient to second or third line based on the NECO guideline. And simultaneously, we will also need to refer the patient for chemotherapy. Next slide, please. Now, coming to gingigo, uh, necrotizing gingivitis, the clinical presentation is inflammation of the gingiva or gums, which may lead to loose of teeth, severe pain, and foul-smelling breath. Now, management is basically maintaining oral hygiene, antiseptic mouthwash, antibiotics like metronidazole 400 mg three times a day for seven days, and pain management with paracetamol or codeine. As this is a WHO clinical stage three condition, we need to ensure that is on effective ART, so we need to do a viral load in addition just to know whether the patient is on effective antiretroviral therapy. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Swetaji, yeah. So if we now evaluate the causes of adenophysia, painful uh, dysphagia, then the causes are, as we earlier said, it is fungal, there is candida, viral, either HSB or CMB. It can be idiopathic, like, like uh, aphthous ulcer. Gastroesophageal reflux disorder can also produce like uh, symptoms like odinophagia and drugs like uh, zidobudine or NSAID. And less common causes are staphylococcus, histoplasmosis. Next slide, please. Now, coming to diarrheal disorders and the other intestinal parasites. Next slide. The definition of diarrhea, we all know that three or more loose or leaky stool per day or as having more stools than is normal for that particular person is considered as diarrhea. There may be associated symptoms like nausea, vomiting, fever, and abdominal pain. And in case of diarrhea in children, an increase in stool frequency more than twice the normal is also considered as diarrhea or three or more loose stool in case of uh, older children is considered as diarrhea. 
Now, if there is visible blood in stool, uh, in, uh, in the diarrhea, we call it as dysentery. And persistent diarrhea means acute onset of diarrhea persisting beyond two weeks is called as uh, persistent diarrhea. Other, however, chronic diarrhea means insidious onset of diarrhea and lasting more than two weeks, then we call it, classify it as chronic diarrhea. Why it is important? Because we'll see that based on this syndromic diagnosis, the treatment also differs. So coming to the next slide. In case of children, this diarrhea is very important to diagnose and treat. Otherwise, diarrhea gives rise to dehydration, fluid loss and dehydration, which and malnutrition also predisposes the patient to develop more of diarrhea, chronic diarrhea, recurrent diarrhea. So this vicious cycle goes on. If we cannot uh, diagnose and treat diarrhea uh, uh, fast in case of children. Now, next slide, please. Now, classification of diarrhea, is either it can be inflammatory diarrhea or it can be non-inflammatory diarrhea. In case of inflammatory diarrhea, it is basically the organism uh, invading the intestinal wall and there, are, there is mucosal bleeding. But in case of non-inflammatory diarrhea, they usually attack the epithelial layer and they stay there and there is increased secretion of water and electrolyte into the lumen. So based on this type of diarrhea, the management of so differ. So we need to know which one is inflammatory and which one is non-inflammatory. Next slide, please. So on the left-hand side, the acute inflammatory diarrhea are Shigella, Salmonella, Campylobacter, E. coli, and Clostridium difficile. And parasitic are amoebiasis and viruses are CMB. And acute non-inflammatory diarrhea is produced by rotavirus, enterovirus, norovirus, and parasite like Giardia. So based on the presentation, we can guess which, uh, which uh, medicine should be uh, effective in a particular patient. Now, chronic diarrhea, non-inflammatory one, can be due to coccidian parasite like uh, cystoisospora, then cryptosporidium, microspora, cyclosporidium, giardia lambda, strongyloid stercorialis, and persistent diarrhea in CLHIV is, uh, can produce malnutrition. Malnutrition also can give rise to diarrhea. And pathogenic E. coli, especially the enteroaggregative type, and prolongation of an acute diarrhea may rarely be a manifestation of cow milk or protein allergy. And antibiotic associated diarrhea. Uh, is possible due to overgrowth of bacteria, common cells, and uh, cryptosporidium infection also can give rise to persistent diarrhea in CLHIV. Now, what are the complications? As you all know, with diarrhea, uh, the person lose loss of uh, electrolyte and fluid. So this gives rise to electrolyte abnormalities and even renal uh, shutdown can be there. And it also gives rise to malnutrition. And in extreme cases, it can go uh, it can develop sepsis also, or bacterial uh, bacterial infection, particularly if the cause of uh, diarrhea is a bacterial one. Next slide, please. Next slide. Next slide. So coming to the bacterial infection, next slide. The epidemiology is that the gram-negative bacterial enteric infection is 10 times more common in PLHIV than in HIV uninfected individual. And this rates decline with PLHIV who are put on ART, that is advanced HIV disease, particularly when the CD4 count is less than 200 uh, cells per cubic millimeter, the incidence of this gram-negative bacterial enteric infections are very common and it is 10 times more than the general population. The bacteria most frequently associated in PLHIV are Salmonella, Sigella, Campylobacter. While Clostridium difficile associated infection is common in PLHIV at a CD4 very low, say less than 50 cells per cubic millimeter, and is an independent uh, disease risk factor. So, the while uh, treating a uh, diarrhea also, we need to know the CD4 count. We need to uh, remember that. The probable source of most of the enteric infection in HIV infected individual is through fecal route. We all know that is through contaminated food or water. Next slide, please. 
Now, clinical manifestations of gram negative enteric bacteria are in some time, it is self limited gastroenteritis to more severe prolonged diarrhea disease, potentially associated with fever, bloody diarrhea, weight loss, even bacteremia or sepsis associated with extra intestinal involvement with or without concurrent or preceding GI illnesses. So, we can have a spectrum of presentation with uh, uh, gram negative enteric bacteria from the self limited one to a uh, bacteremia also. Next slide, please. So diagnosis is basically based on the history and uh, including medication history. Then diagnosis is established through culture of stool and blood. Blood culture should be obtained from patients with diarrhea and fever if possible. And diagnosis of uh, Clostridia difficile uh, infection infestation is complicated and needs careful uh, selection of the uh, testing material and correlation with the clinical and laboratory findings because Mere finding of Clostridia difficile doesn't point to the fact that it is a disease. It can be common cell also. So it is uh, a bit tricky. And uh, the investigations that are done usually are the um, uh, NAT test, different NAT test can be done either in the blood or in the stool sample. There are different protocols. So uh, we can also refer the patient to the uh, medicine department for the management of tropical disease specialist for the management of uh, diagnosis and management of CDI. Now, endoscopy with biopsy may be required for diagnosis like cryptosporidiosis, microsporidiosis, cytomegalovirus, or MAC gastroenteritis in non-infectious and non-infectious causes. We may rarely have to go for endoscopic evaluation and biopsy also. If stool culture fail to yield enteric bacterial pathogen in patient with symptoms of proctitis or colitis, then we need to consider STD. Different sexually transmitted diseases can give rise to uh, diarrhea also. Next. So management is oral or IV rehydration therapy, and we should continue to sustain the rehydration uh, re of the patient. Then anti-mortality drug is not indicated. Then fecal specimen should be obtained prior to initiation of empiric antimicrobial therapy. And uh, if stool sample is obtained, antibiotic susceptibility should be performed to confirm antibiotic choice given increased reports of antibiotic resistance. Now, empiric treatment, usually we start with uh, advanced HIV disease and clinically severe diarrhea. There is more than six stools per day. For PLHAB with persistent diarrhea, there is uh, more than 14 days, but uh, no other severe clinical signs. We can wait for the uh, confirmatory diagnosis and we can uh, institute the effective antimicrobials. The empiric therapy for, uh, for empiric th therapy, the preferred regimen is ciprofloxacin 500 to 750 milligram orally uh, or 400 milligram IV twice daily. And alternative therapy is septriaxone, one gram OD, or cefotexime, one gram TDS. Next slide, please. Now, coming to specific uh, uh, the, uh, causes of diarrhea, salmonella, in case of sal salmonella, the preferred therapy is ciprofloxacin. And alternative therapy are levofloxacin, moxifloxacin, or uh, CPT, I mean, cotrimoxazole, or septriaxone, or cefotexime. Now, duration of uh, treatment in PLHIV with diarrhea is a bit uh, different because if the patient is having gastroenteritis without bacteremia and with a CD4 count of more than 200, the uh, duration of treatment should be 7 to 14 days. That is one week to two weeks. And if the CD4 count is less than 200, then the duration of treatment can go up to two to six weeks. Now, duration of therapy for gastroenteritis with bacteremia, if CD4 count is more than 200, then it is for 14 days or longer. And if CD4 count is less than 200, then it is two weeks to six weeks. So we need to remember this uh, duration of treatment because many a times we need we tend to uh, stop treatment prematurely and it can give rise to relapse or recurrence of the diseases. Next slide, please. So in case of uh, coming to sigillosis, uh, the duration of treatment is 7 to 10 days, except for azithromycin. For azithromycin, it is 5 days. And if it is there is bacteremia associated, then it is more than equal to 14 days of treatment. And for recurrent infections, we can treat uh, extend the treatment duration up to 6 weeks. Uh, 
Now, preferred therapy is again ciprofloxacin. And alternatives are levofloxacin, moxifloxacin, quatrimoxazole, and azithromycin. But for azithromycin, it is not more than five days. It is up to five days. Next slide, please. Now, campylobacteriosis and gastroenteritis also, the duration is seven to 10 days. But if it is azithromycin, it is five days. And for bacteremia, just like the previous one, it is more than 14 days. Or uh, recurrent bacteremia, then it is two to six weeks. Preferred therapy is ciprofloxacin or azithromycin. In case of azithro, it is five days. Otherwise, it is uh, uh, seven to 10 days. And alternative therapy are with uh, levofloxacin or moxifloxacin. Next slide. Now, CDI, the treatment of choice is drug of choice for CDI, CDI is basically vancomycin, 120 milligram, four times a day for 10 to 14 days. Alternative is metronidazole, 500 milligram, three times a day for 10 to 14 days. Next slide. So uh, before going to the children, if we can summarize that in a syndromic, syndromical way, if we can, if we get a, a case of diarrhea, and if we can give, say, cotrimoxazole, uh, uh, double dose, double strength cotrimoxazole twice a day, two up to, say, three to four times a day, based on the severity and response to treatment. And along with that, if we can use, an, uh, say, nitazoxanide, then most of the organisms causing uh, diarrhea in PLHIB will be covered. So it is a syndromical approach one can adopt. Now, next slide. In case of diarrhea, there are different uh, uh, important things uh, to remember. Diarrhea in case of children. First, we need to determine the type of diarrhea. That is whether it is acute watery diarrhea or a dysentery or persistent diarrhea. Look for dehydration and other complications because uh, nutritional assessment is also important and uh, malnutrition also can give rise to dehydration and uh, uh, other complications. Then we need to rule out the non-diarrheal illnesses, especially systemic infection. Patient can have sepsis which may present with also diarrhea. So we need to assess that. And we need to assess the feeding, both pre-illness and during the illness. How the patient was uh, taking food before falling sick and how the patient is uh, taking food after becoming sick. And if there is any change in food habit that we need to gather. Next slide, please. Now in history, onset of diarrhea, duration and number of stool per day. Now, if the onset is acute, then it signifies something. If the insidious, then it is a chronic one. If it is more than 12, 14 days, but if it is an acute one, then it is a persistent diarrhea. Now, blood in stool, whether it is blood is there or not, if it is a blood, then we can go for the causes of dysentery, the num uh, visible blood, the number of episodes of vomiting. So from there, we can assess the severity of the disease, whether the patient needs uh, hospitalization or home-based treatment would be sufficient for the patient. We can know from that. Now, presence of fever, cough, or other significant symptoms, for example, convulsion, recent measles, et cetera, and type of amount of fluid. Why measles is there? Because in case of measles, uh, there can be diarrhea, so we may uh, mistake it to be an enteric diarrhea. Then uh, type and amount of fluid, that is including breast milk and food uh, taken during the illness and pre-illness feeding practices are also important to know because... Uh, if the preparation of food is not hygienic one, then the patient may have recurrent diarrhea. Then drugs or other local remedies taken, including opioids or anti-motility drugs like loperamide, because this can give rise to abdominal distension. And this, uh, this uh, anti-motility, anti-secretory drugs are basically not needed uh, or neither indicated for uh, management of most of the uh, diarrheal cases. And then immunization history. Now, assess, assessment for dehydration, all we know, before going into uh, proper palpation and percussion, uh, inspection is very, very important to know the condition of the child. So, for example, if the patient, whether the patient is alert and active, or he is restless, irritable, or lethargic, or unconscious. So, from an inspection, we are getting this, the state of uh, the severity of the uh, disease. Then, appearance of eye, whether it is normal or sunken, whether it is dry and the ability to drink water. So whether the patient is refusing drink or is very eager to take the drink or is unable to drink due to lethargy or coma. And then we need to touch the baby and feel for the skin targon. If 
by pinching the abdominal skin on the lateral side flank. If it goes back very slowly, that is more than two seconds, then it is a severe dehydration. And if it goes instantaneously back to normal, then there is uh, no dehydration or very little dehydration. Next slide, please. So after classification, based on our classification, the treatment plan is also different. So diarrhea, we know it is uh, uh, watery diarrhea more than three times per day. If it is acute one and less than 14 days and there is no dehydration, patient is well, alert, eyes are normal, tears present, mucosa is moist, not thirsty, drinks normally and skin pain goes slowly then we should institute plan A, that is home-based treatment with WHORS. Now, if there is some dehydration presented with say, restlessness or irritability, any of the two signs or more than that, sunken eyes and tear, absent tear, dry mucosa, and the patient is trusty, drinks very eagerly, and skin pinch goes slowly, then we can also use plan B, hospital-based treatment with the WHORS. And in case of severe dehydration, we can use the plan C, either uh, uh, hospital-based uh, ORS or IV fluid, which we'll see later. Now, classification of dehydration. Some dehydration, in case of some dehydration, 50 to 100 ml per kg fluid loss is there. In case of uh, no dehydration, that is less than 50 ml per kg fluid loss is expected. And in case of severe dehydration, it is more than 100 ml per kg fluid loss is expected. So next slide. Along with Next slide, please. Uh, next slide. So features so in addition to dehydration, you also need to uh, see for malnutrition. There is anthropometric measurement, say weight for height, examination of wasting, edema, signs of vitamin deficiency, and systemic infection that is presence of cough, high-grade fever, first breathing, or chest in rowing, or high-grade fever with splenomegaly. We need to see systemically right from head to toe. We need to investigate all the system. And then fungal infections, whether there is oral thrush or perianal satellite lesions. Fungal infection also points to the fact that the patient has advanced HIV diseases. Next slide. So stool microscopy usually not required and is not helpful. In, uh, except in selected situations such as cholera or GRDSs. Stool culture also has no, not much value in the management of uh, acute diarrhea. And stool for pH and reducing substances is also not indicated in acute diarrhea. The complete blood count, blood gas estimation, serum electrolyte or renal uh, function test, et cetera, required in case of complications of diarrhea like severe pallor, tachypnea, altered sensorium, seizure, paralytic ileus, or oliguria or anuria. Most of the acute diarrheal disorders can be managed effectively even in the absence of laboratory investigations. Next slide. So components of management of acute diarrhea is basically dehydration and maintaining of hydration, ensuring adequate feeding, oral supplementation of zinc, and early recognition of danger sign and treatment and prevention of complication. Next slide. So these are all basically management tips for the uh, CLHIV, diarrhea and CLHIV. Next, dehydration uh, and dehydration, children with no dehydration, treat with the WHORS and uh, home available fluids. Mother should be given ORS and counseled about the, its preparation and method of use, how it is made to be prepared hygienically, and whom available fluids used with preferably salt, including ORS, salted rice water, salted yogurt drink, vegetable or chicken soup with salt. Some unsalted fluid in the form of plain water, unsalted rice water, unsalted soap, yogurt drinks without salt, green coconut water, etc. can be used. Now, commercial carbohydrate beverages are not useful and they should not be used. Counsel about danger signs like continuing diarrhea beyond three days, increased volume or frequency of stool, repeated vomiting, increasing thrust, refusal to feed, fever or blood in stool, and are advised to return to the healthcare facility. If this, uh, we need to counsel the mother or the parents or the caregiver about the danger signs, and in case the patient develops those danger signs, they need to uh, come back to the ART center. Uh, immediately. 
Now, in case of the in case of uh, children less than 24 months old, that is less than two years, amount of ORS to be given is 50 to 100 ml, maximum 500 ml per day. And in case of two to 10 years children, it is 100 to 200 ml, and maximum is 1000 ml per day. And for children more than 10 years, it is 200 uh, to 2000 ml per day. In these are the uh, these are the uh, ORS where children is with is not with any dehydration. Now, children with some dehydration should be treated at, at a hospital. The therapy with ORS should be promptly initiated and continued during transport. And all children with severe dehydration should be promptly and urgently referred to a healthcare facility for rehydration with IV fluid. Feeding should not be restricted in children with diarrhea as this aggravates the complications and increases morbidity and mortality. Further, with uh, early feeding, there is uh, a reduction in the stool volume and it also facilitates uh, sodium and water absorption along with nutrients. And it also facilitates early gut epithelial recovery and prevents malnutrition. Once the child's status starts improving, a higher than recommended intake uh, of food is uh, advised to facilitate complete catch-up of growth. Zinc supplementation is given at the uh, 20 milligram of elemental zinc per day for 14 days in case of children older than six months of age. It is helpful in decreasing the severity and duration of diarrhea and risk of persistent diarrhea. For persistent vomiting, symptomatic treatment with a single dose of online sertron, 0.1 to 0.2 milligram per kg per dose can be given. Now, the important thing that we need to remember, these antibiotics are not routinely required for treatment of acute diarrhea in children. Anti-motility drugs and binding agents are also not recommended in, uh, in uh, the uh, children and infant and can be harmful at times. Now, anti-secretory drugs also should not be routinely uh, used, uh, uh, like uh, routinely used in uh, the management of diarrhea. Antibiotics are indicated in bacillary dysentery, cholera, amoebiasis, and giardiasis. When acute diarrhea is a manifestation of a systemic infection in a malnourished, uh, prematurely born or young infant, age-appropriate systematic antibiotic is to be given. That is, these are the two occasions where we give antibiotic. Otherwise, most of the acute diarrhea in children doesn't need any antibiotic nor any anti-motility drugs or any secretory agents are required for treatment of uh, acute diarrhea in children. Next slide, please. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, yeah, now, management of acute dysentery in children. First line of treatment in a six child is IV septic exome, 50 to 100 milligram per kg per day for three to five days. In a stable child, either ciprofloxacin 15 mg per kg in two divided doses for three days or oral suffixin may be given. But the patient should be monitored for clinical improvement within 48 hours, that is decrease in fever, stool frequency, and blood in stool. If no improvement is seen at 48 hours, antibiotics should be changed appropriately. So, uh, uh, oral azithromycin 10 mg per kg per day for three days can also be used for sigillosis, but the experience is limited. For children with amoebic dysentery, tinidazole or metronidazole is the drug of choice. Any young child presenting with blood in stool and persistent abdominal pain should be suspected to have intersuscitation or and evaluated accordingly. So any diarrhea with uh, any child presenting with diarrhea with pain and blood in stool should trigger the suspicion that the patient may have intersuscitation and accordingly they need to be referred to surgery department for proper evaluation and management. Next slide. Now, principles of coming to persistent diarrhea, the principles are, first, we need to correct the dehydration and electrolyte and hypoglycemia, if any, need to be corrected. Then evaluation for infection using appropriate investigation like hemogram, blood culture, urine culture, and other, uh, and their management are to be done. And nutritional therapy is to be given. Next slide. Coming to cryptosporidiosis. Next slide. It is uh, the most common presentation is acute or subacute onset of watery diarrhea, which may be accompanied by nausea, vomiting, or lower abdominal cramping. Disease severity can be from asymptomatic to profuse cholera-like diarrhea, and more severe symptoms occur in immunosuppressed patient 
whereas transient diarrhea alone is typical in patients with competent immune system. Fever is present in approximately one third of patients and malabsorption is common. And the most important thing here is that atypical presentation rather we, is that the epithelium of the biliary tract and the pancreatic duct can be infected with cryptosporidium, leading to sclerosing cholangitis and pancreatitis, secondary to papillary stenosis. Now, this can, uh, th uh, this is usually found in patients with uh, prolonged disease with low CD4 counts. That is, advanced immunosuppression cases, we may find this pancreatitis and sclerosing cholangitis. Next slide, please. The Diagnosis depends on microscopic identification of the host in stool with acid fast staining or direct immunofluorescence, which offers uh, higher sensitivity. The, and it looks something like the picture on the right hand side under microscopy. Now, concentration method may facilitate diagnosis of cryptosporidiosis, antigen detection by ELISA or immunochromatography. Tests are also useful. Cryptosporidium enteritis also can be diagnosed from small sections of tissues from intestinal biopsy. A single stool specimen is usually adequate to diagnose cryptosporidiosis individual with pro profuse diarrheal illness, whereas a repeat stool sample is recommended for those with milder diseases. Next slide. Prevention is basically by uh, increasing the CD4, CD4 count, that is improving the immunity by early initiation of ART. And treatment is basically aggressive oral or IV dehydration and replacement of electrolyte rapid ART initiation and nitazoxanide, that is 500 milligram to 1000 milligram twice daily for 14 days, or paramomycin 500 milligram four times a day for. Now, next slide, please. Uh, cystoisosporiasis, which were earlier known as isosporiasis. Next slide. The clinical presentation is again, uh, non-bloody watery diarrhea may be associated with abdominal pain, cramping, anorexia, nausea, vomiting, and low-grade fever. Diarrhea can be profuse and prolonged, particularly in immunocompromised patients, resulting in severe dehydration, electrolyte, uh, diselectrolytemias, weight loss, and malabsorption. And diagnosis is by detecting isospora or cyst in fecal specimens. Diagnosis can be facilitated by repeat stool examination with sensitive method, such as modified acid-fast bacilli technique, acid-fast technique, and infection can also be diagnosed by detecting cysts in duodenal aspirates, mucus, or developmental stages of the parasite can be seen in the intestinal biopsy specimen. The prophylaxis is CPT prophylaxis. Next slide. Now, treatment of uh, uh, cystoisosporiasis is basically cotrimoxazole. Uh, either uh, at first we we'll start say uh, double strength of uh, cotrimoxazole twice daily. Now, depending on severity and response to it, it can be increased to three to four times uh, uh, per day. And uh, the duration of treatment is seven to 10 days. However, in uh, severe cases, the duration can be increased up to three to four weeks. The, uh, the alternative medicines for treatment of this uh, cystoisosporiasis is this. isosporiasis is pyrimethamine, 50 to 75 milligram orally, plus licoborin, 10 to 25 milligram orally, once a day. And for uh, uh, the other alternative, ciproproxacin, it is 500 milligram twice daily for seven days, seven to 10 days. Next slide, please. Now, chronic maintenance therapy, we know it is. Uh, Cotrimoxazole, double strand, uh, orally, three times weekly. But basically, we are going for, if the patient is having CD4 count of less than 350, definitely we are going for uh, double strand uh, cotrimoxazole, OD, once a day. And uh, other alternatives are pyrimethamine, 25 milligram oral, uh, or ciproprofacin, 50, 500 milligram oral, three times a weekly as a second line alternative can be given. But basically for all practical purposes is cortimoxazole that we give. And uh, that is also as per the uh, cutoff of uh, CD4 cutoff of 350. So we'll be continuing uh, cortimoxazole at least up when the CD4 goes above 350 cells per cubic millimeter. So we need to... Next slide. Other causes of diarrhea in PLHIV include... Next slide. 
right? Uh, my, uh, MAC can affect the small or large uh, bowel. Terminal ileum is often affected, and there is abdominal pain, distension, or rectal bleeding. And the clinical finding may include hepatomegaly, abdominal tenderness and ascites, abdominal ultrasound may show lymph nodes, and splenic microabscesses may be evidenced, uh, and it may be an evidence of disseminated tuberculosis. Now, cytomegalovirus uh, disease. It can cause ulceration of both small and large bowel. There can be colitis in at around 5 to 10% of patients, and there can be sickle perforation also. This sickle perforation and ulcer can be life-threatening at time, and there are hemorrhages, and uh, both can be life-threatening. Diagnosis is usually made with a patient of diarrhea or with a rectal bleeding, and who is found to have cytomegalovirus retinopathy on fundoscopy. Or if the facility is available, we can go for sigmoidoscopy and biopsy. But most of the time, if there is a suspicion of CMB, then in most of the cases, you will also find CMB, retinopathy or retinitis in fundoscopy. Management is basically IV gancyclovir or it is valgancyclovir orally, 900 milligram twice daily. Next slide, please. Now, strong alloy stercorealis infestation. Larvae are disseminated widely and auto infection occurs, increasing the parasite burden and it may be asymptomatic or may cause epigastric pain. Small bile obstruction can also be there. Chronic diarrhea, recurrent uh, urticaria and larva currents that is rapidly elongating skin eruptions. And if it is untreated, remain untreated, it can lead to hyperinfection syndrome in patients with advanced HIV disease causing meningitis and multi-organ failure. Treatment of choice is ivermectin, 200 microgram per kg orally as a single dose for one to two days. If ivermectin is unavailable, we can treat it with albendazole 400 milligram ED for seven days. Ivermectin has a higher rate of parasite eradication and if suspected or found incidentally, it should always be treated. Suppose the patient has not come with the sign and symptoms of uh, uh, star, star, strong alloy starcoralis. However, if we incidentally find it, still then we need to treat it. GRDL lambda. The treat, uh, treatment is basically with metronidazole 2 gram daily for 3 days or tinidazole 2 gram single dose. For children, metronidazole 15 milligram per kg per day in divided doses or uh, it can be tinidazole um, for more than uh, children for children with uh, more than 3 years of age, 50 milligram per kg maximum that is 2 gram single dose can be given to eradicate GRT lambda. Next slide. Now, the other causes, we all know that lopidamide ritinabib is also associated with diarrhea. So in those cases, we can use some loperamide if we are confident that it is due to lopinavir ritinabib and not due to any uh, gastroenteritis. Or we can also switch uh, lopinavir ritinabib, uh, substitute lopinavir by atazanavir, ritonavir, if available. And if the patient is on TB concurrently, TB treatment, then we must use, uh, modify the anti-TB treatment with the rifabutin and not rifampicin because we know the there is drug interaction between atazanavir and nitronavir. Otherwise, rifampicin will render at a, uh, ART ineffective and ultimate resistance. So if we change the lopinavir, ritonavir into atazanavir, ritonavir uh, because of diarrhea, then we need to remember that if the patient is on TB treatment, then we must uh, change, uh, replace rifampicin by rifabutin. Now, Kaposi's sarcoma can affect small and large intestine. And around 80% of PLHA with Kaposi's sarcoma have GI involvement. Now, often there are no specific symptoms of GIT involvement. Anemia is very common in a PLHA with Kaposi's sarcoma, and GIT involvement is very, very likely. Treatment is urgent chemotherapy and an effective antiretroviral therapy. NN lesions, infective and non infective lesions. Perianal hematoma, this can be found as piles or uh, hemorrhoids. And the treatment is, uh, we can leave it, it will uh, absorb itself. Uh, for symptomatic management, we can use anesthet anesthetic locally. And we can uh, use luxatives. Now for thrombosed pile, it is a surgical emergency and we need to uh, refer the case to the surgeon. And for perianal abscess, this is uh, like any other abscess. It is tender, hot, and often looks like as if uh, there is pus inside. And treatment is incision and drainage. 
and perianal fistula present mostly with the painless anal discharge and itch. On examination, uh, we'll find the distal end of the fistula in the anus. And uh, the treatment is chronic discharging perianal sinuses in PLHIV in most of the cases is due to tuberculosis and the treatment is effective anti-TB treatment. Surgery is not uh, required for treating tubercular uh, perianal fistulas, rather it may cause a lot of uh, severe complications. So if uh, we can diagnose it to be a fistula due to tuberculosis in PLHIV, which is the case in most of the instances, then we can safely treat the patient with the uh, ATT. Next slide, please. Now, infective annihilations in uh, PLHIV. We discussed earlier, but uh, let's see, recapitulate once again. Next slide. So, no, no, next slide. It is infective annihilation in PLHIV. Yeah, no, previous, previous, previous one. So, as we discussed earlier, it can be either uh, uh, it, uh, herpes simplex virus, HSV virus, or HPV virus, or it can be due to proctitis due to some STDs, or syphilis can also give rise to uh, these annihilations. And the treatment of herpes simplex, as we earlier known, uh, earlier discussed, that uh, cyclovid 400 milligram three times a day for five to seven days. And for hemal papilloma, it is basically with the podopilin local application. And uh, based on the availability of other models of treatment of HPV virus. And uh, since this uh, HPV is a pre malignant condition, so we need to refer the patient adequately. And for proctitis, uh, that is with anal discharge or each or pain in the rectum, it can range from mild to severe and it can be due to syphilis. So for syphilis with a prim primary chancre, the classic painless ulcer with raised edges or as a word like uh, HPV word, but less raised. So if we can diagnose it to be syphilis by the VDRL test, then we also definitely treat it with uh, benzathine penicillin, 2.4 million unit. I am. Next slide. I think we have wrapped up, but today it was very, rhythm was very disturbed because of the technical problems. Anyway. Yeah, sorry to all the participants uh, for the technical uh, glitch. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for facilitating this session. Uh, any questions from the participants? So we have one question in the chat box. Uh, in the new case of CMV, also that is when to start ART? Yes, it's a very good question. Uh, just like the principle of management of any other OI, we should first start uh, uh, either uh, there is scientist, then First, we treat both the esophageal one by IV, gancyclovir, and if required, intralesional gancyclovir in the eye, in the vitreous also, under the direct supervision of an ophthalmologist. Only when it is under control, then we should go for the ART initiation. Otherwise, uh, CMB iris can give rise to uh, loss of vision, permanent loss of vision in that eye. So we need to be very, very cautious. If we diagnose a CMB esophagitis, we need to exclude whether there is any uh, CMB retinitis. And if there is retinitis, all efforts to be um, uh, to be initiated to uh, preserve the eye vision of the patient. And if yes, there sir, is, sir. yeah, sir, uh, good afternoon. I am Dr. B N Tripathi from Bhuvaneswar Eye Center. Yes, sir. Please say, sir. Please, sir. <laughs> sir, uh, uh, that was my question actually. But uh, yeah. when I, approximately after what duration of anti CMB therapy in uh, uh, CMB retinitis cases? Uh, ART can be initiated. Approximately, what is the duration gap? Uh, uh, right now, uh, yeah, there is, I think it is two, two weeks. I'll have to see. I'll have to, I think it is two weeks. I'm not sure, but I will, uh, I will inform you later. It is, I think it is two weeks. Okay, okay. I'm, I'm not sure, but uh, duration of therapy for anti CMB therapy is quite longer. Uh, we need to wait for the complete resolution of the uh, lesions. 
no no complete resolution of the uh, basically in of the cmb retinitis the leading role is by from the ophthalmology department okay if there is residual lesions in the eye and if we start art there can be cmb iris flare up and the patient may lose vision for his whole life so okay. it also depends it also depends on the involvement whether it is both eye or single eye or how many lesions are there where is the location of the lesion and if the ophthalmologist is confident that the, even if there is iris iris cmb it will not lead to uh, vision loss then we can start is not it and we can also oh. use steroid and all for the suppression of uh, iris and all there is a regimen you might have uh, seen in cmb uh, retinitis where steroids are also used to prevent cmb iris right so okay, okay. when cmb retinitis is present we need to consult of the and we all efforts to be man, uh, taken to maintain the vision of the patient and in case of uh, the other uh, cmb infections ulcers after initiation of uh, the uh, gancyclovir or valgancyclovir once the symptom starts uh, patient starts responding to treatment we can start uh, art okay sir thank you for for the information sir thank you uh, the session recording will be shared with all the art centers there was a question on uh, will this be uploaded to the youtube yes the youtube recording will be shared with all the art centers via email it is also available on the itech india website any more questions from the participants please feel free to unmute your mic oh sir can we quickly run the feedback poll uh, kiranji Uh, the feedback poll is now visible on your screen please attempt all the four questions a request to all the participants please encourage the art center staff to attend the rdms sessions Oh, Kiran sir, we can end the poll now. Rajiv sir, thank you once again for facilitating this session. Thank you thank to you. all the participants for patient listening. We'll end the session.